Um, <laughs> we're going to be reading um, Lisa Robertson's Time in the Codex, which is an essay from her book, Milling. Um, Dee and I quite regularly over the last few years have gotten together um, to read aloud together. Um, it's been quite an important part of my practice and I think theirs as well. Um, yeah, so we're going to read aloud um, all of the essay except for um, she's got quite extensive footnotes throughout the text, so we're going to miss those out. Um, am I, was I skipping then or was I all good? Uh, a little bit. I think it's fine. It's fine. It'll be what it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I'll start the um, essay opens with a quote from Deleuze, so I'll, I'll read that first and then we'll hit the text. Um, <clears throat> so the problem is not how to finish a fold, but how to continue it, to have it go through the ceiling, how to bring it to infinity. It is not only because the fold affects all materials that it thus becomes expressive matter with different scales, speeds, and different vectors, mountains and wastes, sorry, mountains and waters, papers, fabrics, living tissues, the brain, but especially because it determines and materializes form. It produces a form of expression, a gesaltung, the genetic element or infinite line of inflection, the curve, with a unique variable. So it's Delors the fold. Um, one, I open the codex with a skirty murmur, this arrives. It figures in a sequence that addresses me as its potential. And so I like to face this device, its structural modesty and discretion conceal a formally generous aptitude for proliferation, complexity and differentiation. Two, mostly I seek the promiscuous feeling of being alive. Across the topography of tonalities, the codex amplifies an access. Within its discrete shelter, I move freely among the new sensations. Three, by commodious, I mean, this object furnishes hospitable conditions for entering and carrying. It shelters without fastening. It conditions without determining. With a minimal gesture, the commodious form shows us complexity's amplitude. Four, I submit to ink. I go into the elsewhere of chiaroscuro. The lack of transparency, the elaboration of shadow as a medium makes the codex a soft bomb of potential. The sociality of reading does not always or only pertain to the present. It implicates the multi-temporal generosity of politics. Within this folded time, the person and an impersonal speech test and inflect and mix into one another. The book's darkly confected scene is a speculative, temporally striated polis. Chiaroscuro is also the technique of the uncanny. I am etched with unknowing as I continue. I have crossed into a material reserve that permits a maximum of intuition. The as if of a speculative thinking which is outside of knowledge. Reading shows the wrongness 
of the habitual reification of the social and the personal in a binary system of values. It submits this binary to a ruinous foundering, and so an erotics. Six, multiplying, dividing and interchanging, the uncanny opens up the indeterminacy of identity. It provides an effective convention for the shadowed interchange among strangers. A relation that is not constrained to a unified time. Seven. The inchoate state I crave dissolves and reshapes itself in the codex. Reading feels like a discontinuous yet infinite rhythmic dispersal that generates singularities. It isn't knowledge at all. It's a timely dallying and surge among a cluster of minute identifications. I prefer to become foreign and unknowable to myself in accordance with reading's audacity. Eight. It is the most commodious sensation I can imagine, this being lost. I don't want to leave this charitable structure that permits my detailed dissipation. Its excess of surface is available only ever in measured increments. I might define thinking this way. The partial access in a sequence to an infinite and inconspicuous surface, complexity which is not my own. Nine, the substitution of personae for self, of a series for an origin, of a rhythm for a state. Here in love's tension, love's politics, here in form, the reader loves without knowing. I read for the book, simply because the book is there to be read. Sometimes my fidel fidelity is for materiality. 10. I inhabit its jo joinery. Because of the orderly cont continuity of structural traits, the architectural metaphor is easily assumed. But what the book subtracts from architecture is the originating connotation of the art. Here, origins must be differentiated from beginnings and from historicity. <laughs> Each reading begins a movement among multiple and open theories where memory is impersonal. The tectonics of the book frame, chance and its twisting trajectories, not an origin. A reader is a beginner. 11. I read garbage, chance and accident. I can't fix what materiality is. Reading, I enter a relational con contract with whatever material, accepting its fluency and swerve. I happen to be the one reading. 12. I can't fix what materiality is. I act into happenstance. The codex accompanies what is otherwise an imperative surplus suffered or enjoyed in my body. With its complicity arrives a world and timeliness, form. 13. I read to sense the doubling of time the time of the book's form, which pertains to the enclosure and topology of rooms, allegories, houses, bodies, surfaces, and the time of my perceiving, which feels directional, melodic, lyric, inflectional. 
Then, because of the book's time overlaying my own, reading opens a proposition. It receives in me the rhythm I didn't know I missed. 14. <clears throat> I face something delicate and fragile that could span a great distance and then it closes. One time cancels the other, exercises its authority upon the other. I am suspended between form and perception, inflected with an outside temporality. Attention becomes impersonal. Fifteen. I'll be lost then if reading is dark. In the forest, in the hotel or wherever. Sixteen. In heavy and worthy houses, I feel a violent dismay. It gets harder and harder to be female in one's life in such a house. What has commodiousness become? I abandon the house for the bit. I abandon the house for the forbidden book. Seventeen. Something can change. The dispersed rhythm of a wandering. Musical and conceptual is what its folds construct conduct. Rhythm is a figured, embodied improvisation, not a measure. <clears throat> 18. In the pleasant displacement of identity, another time keeps shaping what I will be. This banal and minimal object plays me plays what living and thinking might be, given luck and commodiousness. Time's just luck. 19. The codex acts out an inaccessibility, the failure of transparency, and it figures this inaccessibility not only as a generative aesthetics, but also as a motive agency of perception, where perception disperses identity in a movement towards unknowing. I want to notice and memorize the non-semiotic meanings the codex inaugurates in my body. 20. Reading in the dark. Here is the acutely sought ruin of identity. Reading begins in me an elaborate abandonment. Desire and identity are not the same. At times it feels like desire displaces or replaces identity. Perception retreats or rather turns towards this dark interiority that isn't my own. The codex continuously transforms desire and this has become a life. 21. I feel astonished that any institution could have placed such an object in my hands, then left me alone with it. Reading misuses privileges, abuses authorities, demands interference. Its commodity is political, not economic. It insists on the distinction between economics and politics. The dimension of thinking articulates itself only in political time. In order to continue, reading resists. I witness the displacement of the political into the codex. 22. Encouraged by such material conviviality, thinking's rhythm paradoxically opens. It undoes itself from identity, there having been little habits or measures binding them. 
The potential relationships between identities and desires loosen and multiply. The undoing poses an extraordinary and pleasing relief. Fear is not absent either. Perhaps the effect of inwardness of the codex in here's as a serial multiplication of access and surface, rather than as a correlative to the trope of psychological depth. Time is in the codex as simultaneity. When we think we go into a confected time. 24. <clears throat> With minimal gestures, the time of my sensing is repeatedly annexed, confounded by the codex, which now lends its folds to thought. What reader emerges from her study simplified? She has exchanged the propriety of an assigned identity for those charitably promiscuous folds. 25, sensual perception and hence cognition is supplemented, not compromised by indetermination. Although the book is a screen of certain intentions, institutional, authorial and readily, intention can't be contained or enforced. Thinking's impersonality moves across the shadowed commons of the codex to be politicized by chance, where chance is a stranger. Thus, the interdiction against reading. It was Rousseau who said that any girl who reads is already a lost girl. The codex, codex has lent her its secrecy. She will read in spite of any law. 27. As the girl leans into chiaroscuro, commodiousness unpleats itself in the interstices of her gestural history and in the time of reading, which becomes a rhythmic infinity. She embodies an unknowable politics by deepening the shadows in places carrying with the anarchy of impersonal memory. Her autonomy does itself and disperses into a devotedly plural materiality. Her identifications are small revolutions and also potent failures of revolutions. She is free to not appear. Thanks for reading that with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa, as well. <laughs>